And now it's time to discuss the most amazing formula in all of mathematics. And this, this equation that we will be looking at is also known as Euler's identity, named after Leonard Euler. And here's a picture. Euler was a mathematician from Switzerland, although he spent a, a lot of his life in Russia. And um, he lived in the 1700s and is without doubt the, the preeminent mathematician of the 1700s and one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. He did a tremendous amount of work in, in a large variety of fields in math and in physics. Um, it's been said that mathematicians uh, name their theorems after after themselves, or, or a theorem gets named after a mathematician, like the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, for example, named after Cauchy and Schwartz, uh, or the Riemann curvature tensor, named after Bernard Riemann. Um, it's been said that mathematicians are in the habit of naming their theorems after the first person other than Euler to have discovered them. Because so many people have done work in mathematics only to find out that Euler has already done, had already done that work or something very similar to it. But a tremendously prolific writer wrote, wrote um, on mathematics, wrote volume after volume of material. Um, all of it uh, original and groundbreaking. Did, did work in calculus, graph theory, mathematical analysis, just a tremendous number of different sub-branches of mathematics and went very deep in all of these. And, um, and the equation we're looking at today is one of the most famous and truly is one of the most amazing formulas in all of mathematics. What we'll be doing here is looking at polar coordinates and um, just real quick if you have x and y obviously any point in the plane can be located with an x and a y value. So written as an ordered pair x comma y and you can see that any point in the xy plane can be found by those two numbers. But you could also imagine instead of x and y you could imagine a point indicated here by a certain distance from the origin which we'll call r and a certain angle theta so if you start over here in standard position and rotate around angle theta at a distance r you get to some point and so you can name this point instead of x and y r and theta and this is what we call polar coordinates and you should see that, that with this method these two variables r and theta can be used to locate any point in the plane. So just like we can locate points in a Cartesian system we can use a polar coordinate system as well. Now if you have a point in the xy plane say right here so say here's our point xy and we're thinking about the polar coordinates r and theta you should be able to see that the the, the x value, which is this value right here, is equal to r cosine theta. And then the y value, the vertical part, y is equal to r sine theta. And what we, what we want to do is to apply those ideas to a point in the complex plane. So let's come over here and draw um, a real axis and an imaginary axis and imagine a point here, a complex number, in the complex plane. And we'll be thinking of this complex number in polar coordinates, r and theta. So normally we would uh, name a complex number with um, a and b, and we would think of this number as a plus bi. But a here, the horizontal part, or the real part, is just r cosine theta, and b, the vertical part, or the imaginary part, b, is r sine theta. So the complex number could be written as r cosine theta plus r sine theta times i. And we'll put the i out front. And you can factor out the r, and it would be r cosine theta plus i sine theta. And that, that's sometimes abbreviated CIS theta for cosine I sine CIS theta. So now let's, um, let's look at our complex plane again and um, imagine just a unit circle on the complex plane. So a circle of radius 1. Uh, let me try that one more time. Okay, that's not bad. Circle of radius 1, in this case, R is equal to 1. 
So for a point on the, the complex plane, on the unit circle in the complex plane, this point here, which we'll call z, pretty common to call a complex number z, z is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta because on the unit circle r is equal to 1. So this point z right here is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So that's our starting point for our derivation. Just setting up the, the notation, what we have here is a complex number on the unit circle in the complex plane and we have the complex number represented in polar form cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now here we go with the derivation of Euler's identity. Right now think of z written here as a function of theta. So we can take the derivative. dz d theta will be the derivative of this and that's pretty easy. The derivative of the cosine function is negative sine. So it's negative sine theta plus the derivative of this. Remember that i, i is a constant. So the derivative of this is going to be i times the derivative of sine theta, which is cosine theta. So dz d theta is negative sine theta plus i cosine theta. Now what, what I'm going to do now is factor out an i. And if I factor out an i from this term, I get i sine theta. That's right, another i actually appears there. And here, factoring the i out obviously leaves i cosine theta. Now if this step was tricky for you right here, just redistribute this i and you'll see what happens. If we multiply i times this, we get a i squared. And i squared is equal to negative 1. So multiplying i times this gives us negative sine theta, which is that. So factoring out an i from here caused the i to be factored out and another i to appear. Those two together equivalent to the negative 1. And then obviously here, factoring out the i leaves the i outside and the cosine theta inside. So I'm just going to flip those around, those two terms there. So this is going to equal i times cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now look at that. Cosine theta plus i sine theta is exactly that, is z. That's our original number. So this is i times z. So we get dz d theta is equal to dz d theta is equal to i times z. How about that? Now let's rearrange this, separate the variables, get all the z's on one side. So we have dz over z equals i d theta. dz over z equals i d theta. And then integrate both sides. So we integrate the left and we integrate the right. When we integrate, just remember that i is a constant. Okay, over on the left, the integral of dz over z is just natural log of z. And the integral of i d theta is i theta. And then take e to the power of the left and e to the power of the, of the right. And so e to the power of ln z is just z. And e to the power of i theta is e to the i theta. So z equals e to the i theta. And what was z? Remember z was cosine theta plus i sine theta. So let's write it like that. Cosine theta plus i sine theta equals e to the i theta. So there you, there you have uh, this, this nice little equation, cosine theta plus i sine theta equals e to the i theta. So anytime you have a complex number in polar form, it can be expressed as, a, as an exponent with base e. Now let's look at the special case if theta equals pi. And watch what happens. If theta equals pi, we plug that in and we get cosine pi plus i sine pi equals e to the i times pi. And these are things that we know. Cosine of pi, remember, 
little unit circle, pi is halfway around. So we get to this point. So the cosine of pi is negative 1 plus i times the sine of pi is 0 equals e to the, we'll write it as e to the pi i, that's commonly how it's written instead of i pi. So we have negative 1 plus 0 equals e to the pi i. How about that? More commonly written like this, e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0. And that little equation is known as Euler's identity. And that's the equation that, that the physicist Richard Feynman said was the most amazing formula in all of mathematics. And it really is an amazing equation. This contains the five most fundamental numbers in all of mathematics. It contains 0 and 1. It contains pi and e and then the imaginary unit i. All of those appear exactly one time. And it contains addition, multiplication, and exponentiation, all appearing exactly one time. Now, I, I personally find it difficult to say exactly what this equation means, because raising something to the power of i, I find to be problematic, because imaginary numbers are exactly that, imaginary. And it's difficult to say what it really means to raise something to the power of i. Nevertheless, the mathematician Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who, who was the greatest mathematician of all time, or who is certainly considered to be so by many, he said about this formula, he said, upon being presented with this formula, the student should find it to be immediately obvious, otherwise he will never be a first-rate mathematician. And so I've been, I've been looking at this formula for, oh, probably 20 years or more now, hoping that it will suddenly strike me as being immediately obvious, and it hasn't quite done that yet. But I do know that it's true, because it can be proven, and, and here's the proof culminating right here in this equation. e to the pi i plus 1 equals 0. And even if I don't understand it as deeply as Gauss did, um, I still appreciate the beauty of it. And hopefully you can see that yourself.